It is 1860, and for the first time in Austin's history, its own survival is not in question. The capital city had endured economic collapse, political enemies, Indian raids, and the hardships of an untamed landscape. At last, Austin had achieved stability. Permanent buildings replaced wooden ones. The population swelled to 3,500. An impressive Capitol building towered over Congress Avenue. But that newfound stability did not extend to the state of politics in Austin. In November, a long simmering crisis boiled over with the election of Abraham Lincoln as president. Now, slavery, one of the South's most sacred institutions, was at stake. The young city found itself at the center of a bitter statewide dispute. On the one hand, there were the fire eaters, led by John Salmon Ford, also known as Old Rip. Slavery is authorized by time, custom, and law. We must defend our social system and our rights to property. The only way to ensure our Southern liberties is to leave the Union. Texans secede. Texas governor and founding father Sam Houston and his supporters wanted to preserve the Union. The Union is worth more than Mr. Lincoln. And if the battle is to be fought for the Constitution, let us fight it in the Union and for the sake of the Union. Secessionists scowled at the fact that many prominent Austinites were pro-Union. The capital may have become a scandalously Yankee-fied, union-loving town, but Austin can no more carry the day than they can pull the sun down. One Austin woman wrote to a relative, My dear uncle, I think the people, at least some of them, have lost their reason. If they keep on the way they are going on now, there will be civil war right here in Austin. I never saw so much excitement politically in my life. Nearly a third of white families in Austin owned slaves, and so the idea of abolishing slavery was a direct threat to their personal property. Even so, residents in Austin and Travis County voted 704 to 450 to stick with the Union. But they were outnumbered. Texans elsewhere sided with the secessionists by a three-to-one margin. Texas would now join the newly formed Confederate States of America. The Battle of Fort Sumter in the spring of 1861 kicked off the Civil War. The fighting prompted most Austin citizens to join the spirit of the Confederacy. Austin transformed into a war town. Eager young men joined one of the several military units, including the Tom Green Rifles and the Travis Rifles. Companies are passing through our city every day and the roll of the drums arouses the spirit of the people. Women's aid societies pitched in to sew uniforms. Members of the Austin Collegiate Female Institute each had a quota to knit six pairs of woolen socks. The Anderson Mill switched from grinding grain to making gunpowder. New Orleans supplied Austin with its wartime intelligence via Houston. But with little rail and no telegraph service, the information meandered its way along mail routes by stagecoach or horseback. One of Austin's newspapers set up a Pony Express to cut down on lag time. I can remember father and mother sitting in the bright moonlight, listening for the clip-clop of the Pony Post's flying feet. But false reports were at least as common as accurate ones. Much of the time, the people of Austin had no way of knowing the real course of events. The war hit Austin's economy hard. By 1862, many businesses had closed. Everyday necessities tripled in price when they could be purchased at all. There was not a sack of flour, a bushel of meal, or grain of any kind, nor a pound of bacon to be purchased in Austin. Paper was an extremely short supply. The Texas State Gazette was printed on wallpaper and tissue. Other newspapers shut down altogether. But the overriding concern in 1863 and 64 was that Union troops would invade Texas. In the 
end, Austin would be spared, but at a great cost. An estimated 28,000 Texas soldiers died for the Confederacy. In April 1865, General Lee surrendered at Appomattox. The war was over. Austinites did not hear the news until almost two months after the war ended. Austin was practically in mourning. The women could hardly believe their men had died, been wounded, mutilated, to be beaten at last. Several thousand Union troops landed in Austin in July. They established headquarters and pitched their tents, but not before flying the stars and stripes for all to see. I, Abraham Lincoln, President of the United States, do declare that all persons held as slaves within said designated states henceforward shall be free. For many slaves, news of freedom came as a shock. I ran off and hid in the plum orchard and said over and over, I was free. I was free. I ain't never going back to Miss Joe. The black population grew dramatically during the 1860s by as much as 60%. By 1870, three out of eight Austinites were black. Freedmen soon established their own communities. Masontown grew on the east side. Wheatville formed northwest of the capital. Clarksville was established in West Austin. Blacks donated their first freely earned dollars toward the construction of a school. Former slaves opened churches and businesses, voted, ran for office, served as policemen, jurors, and aldermen. Austin's growth had been cut short by the war, but now it seemed to start up right where it left off. In 1869, Austin built its first bridge across the Colorado River. Former Confederate soldier William J. Oliphant opened up Austin's first photography studio. Customers flush with money fill Austin's shops, and there is a free intermingling of colors without misunderstanding. Blacks and whites pass and repass without collision. This may have seemed true on the surface, but prejudice had deep roots in Texas. By 1870, the Ku Klux Klan established a thriving local chapter in Austin. Its influence would challenge the true scope of a black person's freedom in the capital city. Austin emerged as a different city following the Civil War and Reconstruction. The streets, buildings, and people were the same, but radical changes in the social system, leadership, and economy had redefined the capital of Texas. <laughs> 